right, so we are back. Trying to get back into the swing of making some more uh, YouTube videos. This is the current state of my third rail high iron K4 project, uh, the 1361. And as you can see, it looks like it's done. And it kind of is, but it's, it's kind of ready for phase two here. As you can see, the weathering is complete. The uh, cosmetic repairs, you can't see on the other side, but like these um, footboards, I replaced the one on the other side. Um, I even went and replaced this little um, steam line from the steam generator. Uh, I had to restore it. The original owner kind of had what was left of it kind of stuffed under here, and it was all mangled. And somebody had pointed it out in the comments, and... Um, I had to go back and look at some of my old photos of my buddy's high iron K4 post-war version that I had on this layout and um, saw what he was talking about and I looked up tons of pictures on this and this is kind of what I came up with. So it's kind of stylized, heavily stylized. It's probably not totally correct. Um, well, I know it's not totally correct. <laughs> There's supposed to be a steam line that comes from under the boiler jacketing somewhere about here across the smoke box and feeds probably saturated steam into it. I'm not going to model that. Third rail never did either. I'm going to let it go. There's so much other stuff I got to do with this engine. Uh, like I said, it looks complete. Um, you saw that little mini running montage. Uh, it's running. EOB is, is functioning well enough. I have it running in the 32 step mode and it's okay. It, it's, semi-responsive most of the time but it's, it's got some funny little quirks to it it doesn't like running in 128 step mode and after a while when it warms up it tends to start dropping chuffs which is pretty strange so i have all the components to convert it over to uh, electric railroad and uh, i will probably do so here pretty soon um, but i just kind of wanted to wrap up the project or at least update it to where it's where it's at currently and um i'll show you here in the next few video segments some of the uh, challenges i went through doing some of the paint work um i had to color match these components that the pilot and this battery box were painted black for some reason there's just things like that i i had a little bit of a uh, um trouble with the weathering I, I tried some new paints i wasn't totally happy with and and you'll see that i'll try not to make this video drag on forever like the last one and uh hopefully just cut to the chase and then kind of get it to the state that it's in now and then maybe the next video will be um the electric railroad setup because that's actually going to be pretty involved i got to do a lot of stuff to get get that in there um one thing you can't see is I also went through the trouble of adding um, a single uh, Lionel Fat Boy. It's an 8 ohm Fat Boy. Um, sounds so much better. I got the sound volume out of it. I went through all the trouble to make a 3D printed uh, speaker enclosure, and I never got the volume levels out of this that I wanted. So this is running with, with EOB. It actually uses the classic Lionel um, heavy duty rail sounds power supply. So it should it should. It should sound better than, than the uh, stuff that Third Rail puts in there. And, and sure enough, it did. Once I got the Lionel Fat Boy in there, um, this thing sounds pretty cool, as you could hear in that little uh, running montage. So uh, anyway, let's get to it. One of the many screw-ups on my part working on this engine was um, when I went to paint my uh, fabricated footboard here on the fireman's side of the cab. I just masked off the uh, cab side with, with a piece of blue masking tape and didn't think much of it. Painted the uh, footboard and then tore off the masking tape and then tore off the decal of, of the cab number. Luckily, I had a partially used set of uh, O-scale, micro-scale Penzi diesel decals, and um, I ended up using the, uh, the uh, number fonts from that set. And... Uh, I was able to um, recreate the cab numbers on both sides. All right, so I've been brushing micro set onto this decal and it's starting to break up. 
I think these numbers are a little bit oversized, but I think once this is weathered up, and if I never pointed it out, maybe nobody would notice, so don't tell on me. I think they're pretty straight. Um, the old trick I've been using is uh, actually my camera grid, uh, grid lines on my uh, iPhone here. Help me get the alignment and uh, I don't know. I think it's pretty close. We'll give it a look down the side here. Yeah, it looks all right. So I know I should be finishing this engine up, but I couldn't resist. I wanted to play with my 3D printed traction tires some more. So this was the original set I printed out of TPU. And I was really pleasantly surprised to find that it printed basically with the same uh, properties as uh, PLA. So there was nothing magic about printing these guys. It was just getting the dimensions right. And, I, and this was like the first or second shot, you know. So... Um, they helped tremendously. The engine had no traction whatsoever, obviously without tires, and it couldn't get out of its own way. So with these tires installed, I could at least pull about a half dozen of those GGT um, P70s and, and a couple head-end cars, you know, um, without slipping too bad. But I decided I was going to try to get some more traction out of it, so I made a slightly thicker set. I believe these were like 42 and a half millimeters outside diameter and probably like 40 inside diameter. That's the inside diameter of this channel here. And these tires are very thin. You, uh, you know, you can't always get these from, from Scott at third rail. So I just decided, what the heck, for 20 bucks, I'll try some TPU. And if I'm successful, I don't have to bug anybody for traction tires again. So anyway, getting back to the thicker experiment, this pulled much better. Uh, the S1 out there on the layout right now is pulling a very heavy train. You saw uh, that train in the last video. Um, it's got a bunch of head-end cars and, and about four P70s. And uh, the 1361 will now pull it, but it does protest a little bit. It, it'll start slipping. And uh, um, so I decided to go one more step. Here's a, a raw print. And what I'm doing now is I'm printing this tie, these tires one at a time so I don't get like a little... Um, little extra nipple or something when it when the uh, printer head changes from one tire to another if I'm printing multiples I'm printing one at a time and I'm printing uh, direct to the uh, directly right to the platen um, and I all I really did on this one to make sure it stuck to the platen was I, I turned up the platen temperature to like 63c so this is all I have to really clean off it is just this this stuff here so I'm gonna try these I got the other one on already on the engineer side and uh, I'm gonna put these on and see if they don't they don't stick out too, too far, too proud of the uh, tire, and uh, see what the pulling power is like. All right, it's on there. It's definitely thicker. Kind of like what you'd get from a current product, I think. So let's uh, get this back together and go give it a try. All right, let's give this a try here. this heavy train. All right, let's see if it'll do it. Oh, no, that's too heavy of a train. Yeah. You know what though? At least the tire stayed on. That was one of the other tests to make sure they don't peel themselves off. But this is such a heavy train. I mean, this is obnoxious for this engine. I would expect maybe, you know, four of these P70s and maybe half of those head end cars, you know. But uh, it's actually much better than it was. Let's try another start, try another startup on it. 
All right, let's try it one more time. Let's see how bad it is. Oh, yeah. The first speed step, it's not even... So I took those two very heavy brass third rail head end cars I had on there, that uh, BM70M and that theater scenery car. So now I just have four P70s and uh, I got about three Weaver B60 variations on here, an X29, another B70 of some type from uh, Golden Gate, and an MTHR50. So that's a pretty respectable train for this little guy, I think. Um, so let's see if it walks away with these guys. Here's a first speed step. Uh, not too shabby. I mean, I can see something. If I do this, let's see what it does. I mean, it... But if I do that, it picks it right back up, you know, and it's not peeling off my tire under strain here. I don't know, but I'm, I'm really happy with these traction tires. And, you know, if I wrote them out in a few months or whatever, I just print them. I think they're like 20 cents for a set of two, uh, if I did the math correctly. But what's nice is it's walking away with this train and if I just stop it, stop it again, turn the sound up a little bit so you can hear. I mean, it's walking away with a train without too much drama. It just uh, was a little overloaded with those uh, other head-end cars. I mean, this is even kind of heavy, too. Let's see what it does here. I mean, it rolls out, responds to... Uh, response to the commands and stuff so all right i really meant to keep keep this project moving i wasn't even sure i wanted to do a last video on it because the way the way these videos work everybody like watches the first one and then maybe they watch half the second one but uh anyway i think we're gonna go into the paint shop now all right this is probably fairly uneventful to witness but uh i'm just gonna clear coat this guy i'm using uh trying something new here some vallejo matte varnish um because i've burned up the last of my model masters uh flat clear so i need to find something uh to get used to working with um other than dull coat i don't shoot dull coat every time um I think I'm gonna stick with doing a full uh, acrylic job on here. I do like dull coat, it's pretty reliable. It's just kind of stinky. And uh, I don't feel like smelling it right now. And I wanna try this as an experiment to see if it's a viable option for the future. I'm just checking my masking tape job, it's terrible. So, for some reason, I like clean windows on my weathering jobs. I don't know why, I like the contrast. Um, I hate weathering over the windows anymore. Um, so, oh, I don't know if I mentioned that I I put this uh, power reverse line in here. They had the standoff for it, and they even had the hole in the cab for it, but it was never installed. So I just had some scrap wire. I think some spring steel wire. And uh, a lot of them in real life had that bow to them anyway. Just thought it looked better. All right, let's get some uh, flat clear on this. See if I can kind of unify the sheen a little bit too. From that to there. We'll see. All right. 
So here's my uh, first coat of flat clear, or in this case, Vallejo matte varnish. So you can see we, we kind of unified the different sheens from my different paints that I used and stuff. And if I did it right, my decals should be uh, set in pretty good with a coat of clear over it. I don't know what this other stuff is, but anyway. Okay, so hopefully I'm not drowned out by the sounds of my, uh, my air cleaner and my compressor, but uh, I wanted to get started on the weathering um, now that I have the, the clear on here. I'm kind of happy with this matte varnish look. I think it's pretty good, so I'm gonna start doing some uh, grimy black here with the old trusty VL. So I'm thinking I'm gonna experiment on this engine and uh, go with these model air colors and see if I can do an engine with them. Um, black gray will be my grimy black replacement. Dark earth for uh, rust and um, dust and uh, dirt kind of under spray, I guess, and some black for soot. Um, these are the real basic colors. I may uh, pull out some railroad tie brown. Sometimes I like to use that on the trucks. I'm gonna try these colors first. Let's see if I have a darker color brown in my cabinet, maybe for the uh, trucks and some of the running gear. Well, it doesn't look like it, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep some uh, railroad tie brown on standby here. Um, I'll make it uh, a mission to find this replacement color someday in Model Air. That is if I like the way this comes out. All right, here's a quick layout color test. I think it looks pretty similar to, uh, there's a classic grimy black paint job back there. Let's see if I, I don't know, you know, it looks a little more speckled than I like. pretty well dry to the touch right now, but you, you can even hear the uh, paint must be drying a little bit more in the air. I don't know, does that look speckled? Let's take a closer look. All right, here's a real quick layout color test. Like I said, right now it's just grimy black and some black on the uh, smoke box here, but uh, some of this I don't like too much. There's some uh, speckling here I don't like too much. Let's see if I can fix that. That uh, Model Masters wasn't, um, didn't have a habit of doing that so much. So if I have to, I might put a quick coat of uh, Model Masters over this. See if I can tone this down. Hmm. All right, you guys. I don't know if you've watched my other videos, you know how much I like my old Testers Model Masters paint, which was kind of the remainder of the polyscale line at one time in acrylic. So I went with all this model air technology here and kind of approach this weathering the way I normally do where I like to lay down a flat clear first and then do my colors over it. Um, what I realized is that my model master's paint lent itself to that technique because it was so durable. Uh, I was playing around with a tender and I just wanted to try doing some little kind of targeted pin washing in here. I like to do that after the clear and the first coat of Grammy Black, just to kind of um, sort of emphasize the details, anything that pops upward. And I noticed right away, I just burnt right through the paint. Now, I, 
I ended up getting a little uh, curious about it and took a just a blue shop towel and dampened it and just rubbed right through here. Now I can't tell if I actually went through this matte varnish. So I ended up wiping everything off the fireman's side of the tender here. And I mean, it looks like I went right back to the original finish. So I don't know. So then my next phase was I, I took a sponge and dampened it. And you know, this is a few days later. I can rub this right off. Very little pressure here. So I don't know, I'm a little disappointed. So I think if I was to use this more, I like the color. I didn't necessarily like the way it laid on. Um, I think what I'd be inclined to do is to do the grimy blacking first and then protect it with dull coat. And I think real dull coat because I'm suspicious that I'm taking off this matte varnish. I'm right back to the original finish. So, I don't know. I'm going to continue scrubbing this off where I can. And uh, I may just go back to doing my classic technique. Um, probably dull coat, real dull coat, and then grimy black over it. Just in the spirit of wanting to move this project out of my workshop, it's kind of hung out too long, but... Maybe the other thing I could try is some of that Tamiya German Gray. But right now I'm at the point where I just kind of want this out of the shop. So I'm going to do my best to uh, clean it up and uh, see if I can recover. I'm very confident I can. I just, it's a little bit more time. So I don't know. I'm a little disappointed though. Um... We'll see. If you listen to my other videos, I used to like doing the clear first and then a grimy black because I felt like I had more control over uh, the layering. And because the Model Master stuff was so durable, whether from, you know, mechanical action of, you know, wearing off the very thin coats of paint um, or chemically, like if it got exposed to water or even a little bit of smoke fluid, um, you know, you could you could wipe it sometimes, and even sometimes you could you could sort of burnish in an oil droplet, and, and it would be fine. The uh, model masters, I'm telling it, losing this was such a big deal. I don't know if I'll ever really find uh, a decent replacement. So. I may reserve this for very special projects. I think I got about a half dozen bottles left. So let's let's uh, continue on. Uh, I, uh, I'll show you the engine here real quick, though. So here's what I have for the uh, engine finish. I wasn't really happy with this anyway. I don't like this uh, speckled look. Um, and it was just the way that paint flowed. I, I mean, I thinned it and everything, but... I feel like uh, the Model Masters was a lot more controllable. And, you know, toward the end when they were in those small bottles, they were very consistent when you bought the stuff. You didn't have to play with it a whole lot. I could shoot straight from the bottle. I used the biggest tip in that Posh VL, and uh, I probably shot around 22, 25 PSI. And that's been something I never really had to play with or think about since. But now that I'm playing with some different stuff here, I'm not real happy with this look. It's very obvious this was airbrushed, and that's that's kind of what I'm trying to avoid. I want it to look very natural. In the real world, the soot coming down on the engine, the combination of the paint being baked by the heat of the boiler, um, heat of the sun, rays of the sun, whatever happens, you've got some uh, you've got some loss in the paint chemistry, and then you got the addition of the environmental effects from the locomotive, from the rails, the environment in general. This just looks like a guy hit this with an airbrush. <laughs> so I don't know if that makes any sense. 
So let's see. Yeah, you can see it on the roof. It's very airbrushy looking, so. All right, well, live and learn. Learning something new all the time, especially when you gotta change things up to adapt to the uh, new realities. <laughs> all right, good as new. <laughs> kinda, kinda the opposite of what I was going for, but uh, you know, it's how it goes sometimes. Um, Actually, this is kind of a technique I've used on some box cars and uh, reefers before um, where I sprayed grimy black on real heavy and then kind of uh, scrubbed it off with the model masters I used to use like uh, a little bit of water maybe some Windex and uh, some really fine steel wool um, what was cool is the grimy black would stick under these seams and in the rivet lines it's something I wouldn't do on an engine but maybe maybe there's some hope for this model air it's a technique I can use in the future maybe on a freight car or something um, but yeah right now we're kind of back to where I want to think about what's next. I think I'm going to try scrubbing the engine. I'm going to take the chance and leave the grimy black coat on the uh, running gear as a base. Um, I'll probably clear over it. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of where we're at now. So I may go ahead and use just classic dull coat. There's the top. So you can see how some of the grimy black is left behind. That's actually kind of a cool effect. Uh, it's not what I was going for though. Um, so anyway, keep going. Okay, so here's the tender. So after cleaning it down, I kind of went back and resprayed with that gray black model air. And then um, a couple of coats of Model Masters flat clear because I was a little hesitant to uh, put real dull coat over this, just in case um, there's some kind of weird reaction, but I don't know. That'll be an experiment for another time. So right now, I, I think this is, this is fine. Pretty dirty. It's the way I wanted this to look, kind of toward the end of its career. On the trucks, I shot a little Model Air um, Dark Earth and then did a wash over it and then dry brushed it just to pop the details back out. So I, th I think that was a nice effect on these trucks. So the other problem I'm having, I kind of noticed this thing rolled like a brick and uh, this stupid tether, I had it fastened down. Um, you see where it comes out, there is no way this thing's going to run with that tether in place. So let's take it into the shop again. I may visit the uh, mill. I may open out, I may open up that uh, slot where the tether comes out. Good grief. This thing's never going to leave the shop. The longer it sticks around, the more stuff I, I find I want to do with it. Oh, man, I really don't even want to take this tender apart again. It's a pain in the butt because this arrangement here, there's some wiring for the rear light. It always gets tangled around it. So I don't know. All right. So I want to move that slot over inboard a little ways okay so it was a fairly simple clamping job and uh kind of eyeballed the alignment and what i hope to do is just run the uh x-axis here in and um kind of stop at that depth and then move my Y across like this. So, wish me luck, we're going in. All right. 
going to start the uh, widening operation. Alright, we're going to come back out now. Not totally terrible. The radius matches a little bit. So now our slot's a lot closer to that center beam. Should give me plenty of room to sneak that uh, anaconda of a tether out. All right. So I slotted out that hole for the tether and um, I ended up putting the strain relief clamp up inside the tender so you can't see it. I didn't film that, but I think I got myself more clearance here. So uh, we're not rubbing on that all the time. Like I said, nice uh, problem to find right toward the end here. I'm really unhappy with the sound volume of this engine and, and I know it's getting kind of late in this project stage, but I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, the sound volume on this engine is, is pretty anemic. Uh, the current speaker that I went through the trouble of creating this um, enclosure for uh, is only a half watt rated speaker. So... I have this nice Lionel Fatboy, and I've used these before. Um, this was for Lionel's like single speaker solution to be driven off of their um, their audio driver on the uh, audio board here, which which is the uh, I've talked about it before. It's it's like a one and a half watt little um, audio amp on here. I'm not quite sure if the gain is set up on that amp to to drive one watt, but uh, or one and a half watts, which is like the full rating, but I know that I've done this before and this speaker doesn't exactly get overdriven and it should produce some nice sound volumes. So to fit that in there, um, I'm going to remove this switch cl cluster here, this whole standoff that goes under the, um, the water hatch here on the tender deck. So i um, in the process of simplifying the control. So I won't I never really utilize this cruise on off switch anyway. Um, when cruise is on, the, the switch is actually open. The volume pot, I'm gonna dummy out and just control volume with a cab one like I do in all my other projects. And I already made kind of a switch mount for the program run switch, which is all I really need. So I 3D printed an adapter that fits under there. So, Plus I'll have the wiring, uh, it's gonna be a little more simplified, be easier to put back together. So I think this should fit right about here. I'm not sure if I'll have to, it's pretty tight. I may have to mill out the uh, tender shell a little bit. You can see these, these uh, curved insets or whatever for the current speaker. It would be awesome if I could center the speaker right over the uh, the original one's location. I've got some freedom to move this uh, EOB setup back and forth away, so I could almost set it up like this, even if I had to. And. Uh, Give myself a little extra clearance here. 
So I have this little uh, Sherline 400, or 5400, I'm sorry. And uh, I got it a while back. And I really love this thing. Um, for doing basic jobs like this, where you gotta drill basically a hole pattern, and this is a very simple one, I just need to do two of them, but uh, I just, you know, I want them in line. I got the centers figured out, but this this simple machine is so great for stuff like this. So basically, once you line up the one uh, hole and pop it, you can uh, just move the uh, x-axis across and get the other one. So it'll help me uh, get stuff together a little straighter. So now I got that one popped through. I'm just going to advance on to my next one here. So if I did a good job lining up my uh, workpiece here, which is my tender frame, once I made that excursion with my x-axis, these two holes should be perfectly in line. So pretty simple operation, but man, it, I don't know why it's so much fun though to play with this thing. It's awesome. Okay, well it all fit. I just had to hog out the uh, tender sides just a little bit, not a whole lot. So we're gonna put it back together. So that's what I ended up with, whatever it is. Um, third rail never did model the uh, steam line coming into the generator. I'm not gonna bother either. I just wanted to capture this. I don't know if it's a check valve assembly or what, but I know there's some kind of drain down to the uh, bottom of the front of the smoke box there. So that's what we got. I'm gonna run with that, call it good.